Oh, this must be the podcast. Time Magazine, 10, 10 or 15 years ago, put out an article that said, you know, the top 10 conspiracy theories of all time. And when you actually do polling on some of the conspiracy theories they talked about, a lot of people haven't even heard of them, or only, you know, negligible amounts of people believe in them. You know, less than 10% believe that the moon landing was fake. I think they put it around 5, 5 or 6% with a margin of error of 4. Hello, everybody. Today's show is a conversation with Joe Uzinski, a political science professor in Miami, Florida, and co-author of the book American Conspiracy Theories. I had some audio problems on this one and almost decided to scrap it, but making these shows is a learning process, so I did my best to salvage it. Joe did his PhD work on how public opinion drives the news. He only got into researching conspiracy theories after arriving in Miami. So my and said, I want to do something on conspiracy theories. And I said, okay. And it was sort of an off topic at the time. This was 2009. And I started looking around for literature, and there wasn't really anything that did anything empirical. I mean, you had Richard Hofstadter back in the 60s. You had other historians, and then you had these sort of cultural accounts that sprouted up in the 90s. Um, but there wasn't anything that was data-driven. Mm-hmm. And and I said to him, I said, you know, geez, if we're going to do something that's empirical, there's no data. So we're going to have to collect data somehow. Joe and his co-author spent more than five years conducting surveys and looking at historical data, including letters to the editor of the New York Times for 120 years in order to draw their conclusions. So we sort of make the point that this is an inherently political phenomenon, not just a cultural one and not just a psychological one, but one that is inherently driven by power and ideas about power. As you might suspect, the less powerful people feel they are, the more they are inclined to believe in conspiracy theories. Think about every conspiracy theory you've ever heard. Every, every villain in it is always somebody who's incredibly powerful. You never hear a conspiracy about the homeless guy with no legs on the corner. He's never conspiring against you. But it's always the people who have immense amounts of power, or at least we think they do, that are conspiring against us. And this is interesting in itself because if you go back to classical political theory, Specifically Machiavelli, his argument is that people who are powerful don't need to conspire. Why? Because they have brute force and can do what they want, right? Yeah. So it should be, it should be the least powerful people who are conspiring because that's the only means that they would have available to them to get anything done. Right. So when you look at conspiracy theories, it's always about the most powerful people on the planet doing things secretly. And the question to me is, well, you know... If they're so powerful, why are they sneaking in the dark? Why don't they just do whatever they're going to do? I mean, it's sort of like any theory about the Illuminati and the New World Order. It always comes down to, well, they're able to get away with what they're doing because they're so powerful and so influential. And then if that's the case, well, why, you know, are they sneaking around? If they control everything, then why isn't it the case that they just institute their one world government? or kill off 90% of the population, or do whatever the hell it is they're going to do, because they apparently can do it. Talking with Joe reinforced my belief that conspiracy theorists don't know history. They know Hollywood. I guess I'm always reminded of the 1970s Bond movies, where Roger Moore's James Bond is always up against these um, megalomaniac conspirators who want to kill off everybody and then create some magical utopia just for themselves. And you see this in Moonraker and you see it in The Spy Who Loved Me. And I think there's a couple other Bond films that that do something similar to this. Um, You know, where 
it just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. you know, they have this grand plot and they're doing it in secret, but there has to be millions of people involved and no one questions it. No one catches them. And then the, the whole point of the conspiracy is just so stupid. You know, like, oh, we think that there's a conspiracy to kill off, you know, nine tenths of the, of the world's population. Why? Why would anyone want to do that? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And they're like, well, because they know something or they're so smart that they figured out that the planet can't live on with this many people. But the thing is, when you research stuff like this, what you find is that if you were to kill off nine tenths of the world population, our economy would be ultimately destroyed. We wouldn't be able to produce the things we have or, or live with the lifestyle that we have, even the very rich. Right. Right. Their level of, of, of their style of living would be crushed. Right. If you were to do that. So these things are just ultimately self-destructive. <laughs> Joe says we should ask ourselves how many people would be needed to make a plan work. And how likely are those people to keep a secret? If you think about it, at work, if you have two colleagues who have sparked a romance, it takes about a week for everyone to know. <laughs> and, and that's low stakes and two people. And if they get caught all the time, then, you know, these massive conspiracy theories involving thousands of actors across the globe doing all sorts of risky things, you know, it just, it, it just can't be true. Right. So, or, or let me rephrase. It's not that it can't be true. It's just the likelihood of it being true is incredibly low. I mean, take Watergate. I mean, there was a handful of dudes and they get caught doing a simple thing, breaking into a freaking hotel room. <laughs> and that's, that's small beans compared to the sort of high-risk stuff that many conspiracy theor theorists suggest that the conspirators are doing. Joe's not as concerned about the popularity of unrealistic conspiracy theories in pop culture as I am. And he makes some good points. One thing that's important is to separate the popularity of it from actual belief in the conspiracy theories themselves. Right. Now, conspiracy theories are really big in the news. Like, the news loves to report on every new conspiracy theory that comes out. So, they make big news, but that doesn't mean that a lot of people believe in it. And it doesn't mean that the news is reporting it in a way that's positive. Right? Right. right. And, and good conspiracy thrillers and good conspiracy movies do well. Uh, but it doesn't mean that people walk out believing in the conspiracy that the movie propagated. And it doesn't mean that those movies do well as, as you know, anti-conspiracy theory movies. Like, JFK was a big movie, but it pales in comparison to the success of Wizard of Oz, which at its core is an anti-conspiracy theory movie. <laughs> so, um, it has its audience, um, but we shouldn't confuse popularity and having a place in pop culture with people really believing these things. I mean, a great example of that is um, Time Magazine 10, 10 or 15 years ago put out an article that said, you know, the top 10 conspiracy theories of all time. And when you actually do polling on some of the conspiracy theories they talked about, a lot of people haven't even heard of them or only, you know, negligible amounts of people believe in them. Like, they have the reptilian conspiracy theories, the top ten. But no one believes in this. I mean, you, you, it's probably less than 1% of people believe in the reptilian elite conspiracy theory. Moon landing's another one, very popular. You know, when I tell people, oh, I study conspiracy theories, they say, oh, the moon landing and this and that. And I say, yeah, but, you know, when poll, polls show that, you know, less than 10% believe that the moon landing was fake. I think they put it around five five or six percent with a margin of error of four. It's 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 a negligible amount of people that believe in that, even though it's a very popular conspiracy theory, just not one that's believed in. According to Joe's research, some people seem to be more inclined to believe in conspiracies than others. And this is independent of their political party or ideology. People who are inclined towards conspiratorial beliefs will apply their politics to conspiracies. 
So Republican conspiracy theorists believe that President Obama is a secret Muslim born in Africa. And Democrat conspiracy theorists believe President Bush planned 9-11. According to Joe, one of the reasons why the conspiracy stories surrounding President Kennedy's assassination continue to be so popular is because they can fit into anyone's ideological persuasion. Because it's, it's, everyone can choose their own adventure with it. You can blame Johnson, you can blame Castro, you can blame the military-industrial complex, you can blame the CIA, you can blame whoever you want. And that way you can always make the theory mesh with all of your other beliefs. So that's why people are able to, to match onto it, because it, it's not going to be rejected by their other political views. You know, so when people do polling on it and they say, do you believe in it? You get these majority of Americans say yes. Then when you start saying, well, who did it? That's when it starts to really shrink. And so you have 5% say this, 10% say that, 8% say this. So you wind up with a lot of disagreement in the, amongst the people who believe in it. And that's the reason why it's so popular and why it lives on. Right. In my documentary, Conspiracy Theorists Lie, I show many items I have come across on the internet. Some crazy conspiracy stuff, and some more reasonable items. One of the reasonable things I cite is an article that Joe co-authored about how both the political left and the political right are equally prone to fall for conspiracy theories. So the article that you show actually got us in quite a bit of trouble because I think one of the things you allude to in the movie is that, you know, if most people were asked to close their eyes and imagine who, that, who a conspiracy theorist is, the image that would pop up in their mind would be some 40-year-old conservative white dude hanging out in the basement with a ham radio. You know? Right. Uh, somebody, who looks, somebody who looks a lot like me. <laughs> and, and, um, but that's wrong you know and what we find in our polling is that men are equally as likely as women to believe to be conspiratorial in their worldview conservatives as much as liberals and the truth is it's not even members of the two parties that are the most conspiratorial it's members of third parties or independents Right. And to have the most uh, conspiratorial worldview. It's, it's, conspiracy theorizing is really an equal opportunity game. I mean, there are some stereotypical things that hold true in the average, right? People who make less money are more likely to be conspiratorial in their, in their worldview. People who are less educated. That's on average. Now, obviously, Donald Trump shows up, you know, very much an exception to the rule educated and incredibly wealthy, but he's very much a conspiracy theorist. The one big area where Joe and I disagree is over the two major parties. Joe is a libertarian, as I used to be, and I think he too cynically dismisses the similarities between Republicans and Democrats. I mean, my view of the two parties is now that they're just exactly the same. All they are are mechanisms for sets of, of interests to get stuff. And there's no real ideology there that matters. Um, they're just there to get stuff for particular constituencies, be they constituencies of voters or particular interests, interest groups. Um, and so at their core, all they are are mechanisms to get stuff for people using the arm of government. Mm -hmm. That's it. And for me, th that makes the that makes the R's and the D's one and the same. Um, Do you even think you that know, that's true with with Trump being <laughs> the candidate? Yeah, I mean he, that's most certainly true with Trump. I mean Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton want to get stuff for middle class voters give them free college, you know, and they, they're giving that to the more educated middle class, and uh, Donald Trump wants to give it to the uneducated um, uh, middle class. He wants to give them more manufacturing jobs. 
You know, so they're just doling out stuff to their constituencies that they want. And both of them want to do tariffs. Both of them want to control sections of the economy with government force. Um, both of them want to want to pass all sorts of laws and make the world they want it to be by using the force of government. Same thing. They just want to do it in very slightly different ways, but the same thing. It's 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 the same. There are no differences. And and I think people are confused if they think that there are. So libertarianism is just a way for me to get out of that and have, have a true ideology that says that markets can do this better than force or planning and that the, all the great things that people do aren't done by government. They're done by private individuals testing and experimenting and failing over time and that you just can't pass some law that will make everything better. And that whenever big government people point to market failure, they never discuss government failure. And those government failures are worse. In many ways, I can see what he is saying. But I do not believe it is that simple. Republicans and Democrats are not the same. And the end result of any election is going to make a very big difference to the future of you and your children. More importantly... I believe Donald Trump is uniquely horrible and must be stopped regardless of any other ideological concerns. But I appreciate Joe's insight, and I hope to talk with him again in the future. Next time, I will be talking with a friend of mine and former work colleague, cartoonist Patrick Lewandowski, about his satirical work and the presidential election. Thank you for listening to This Must Be the Podcast. Our host is James K. Lambert. Our music was composed by Steve Yeager, and I'm the announcer, Keith Kopatz. This Must Be the Podcast is a jameskaylambert.com production. I think at the end of the day, I think what, I, what really surprised me is, is, is now I don't have a very good view of why people believe anything. <laughs> I, I hold out positive feeling for humanity in the long run and at the macro level, but at the micro level, um, I really don't have a lot of faith in people, myself included.